Have you ever wondered if the Bible we know today might not include every detail of God's laws, the lies of the patriarchs, or even the full creation story? The Book of Jubilees, a lesser-known ancient text still found in the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible, claims to fill in some of these gaps. This book suggests hidden stories, secret laws, and a deeper understanding of God's design. But here's the mystery. Why was it banned from the wider Christian world? What in its 50 chapters was deemed so controversial that it was left out of the mainstream Bible? Today, we're diving into the Book of Jubilees, often called Little Genesis, to explore its unique insights and the reasons for its exclusion from most of Christianity. The Book of Jubilees adds forgotten details to the Genesis narrative, showing a cosmic order that encompasses angels, a divine calendar, and hidden commandments meant to shape humanity. This text doesn't stop at a simple retelling. It argues that the calendar many of us follow today is completely wrong. Jubilees insists that God established a sacred structure for time itself, an ancient rhythm that the world has largely ignored. So, why did early church leaders decide that this book was too much for mainstream Christianity? What secrets could it hold that they felt might shake the foundations of their teachings? The Book of Jubilees starts with an account of creation that feels familiar, God bringing the universe into being. But it goes further, claiming that alongside the act of creation, God structured time itself, aligning it with His divine will. This isn't just the familiar concept of days, months, and years. It's an intricate solar calendar governed by heavenly beings, a calendar that isn't only about marking days, but living in tune with God's cosmic rhythm. According to Jubilees, humans were meant to follow this divine calendar of 364 days, divided into four seasons, each precisely 91 days. With this setup, sacred events like the Sabbath and religious festivals would always fall on the intended days, a perfect structure forgotten by the world at large. Imagine a calendar that ties every moment directly to God's plan. In the traditional Genesis narrative, we learn about the creation of Earth, water, animals, and people. Yet, Jubilees goes further, describing how even before the earth was formed, angels were created on the first day. These heavenly beings weren't just spiritual entities. They played a direct role in managing the universe, regulating both time and the natural order. Each angel was given specific duties, with some overseeing cosmic events like the sun's path and the changing seasons, while others acted as messengers or guardians of God's commandments. This idea of angels as cosmic caretakers might feel familiar from other ancient texts, but Jubilees uniquely portrays them as essential figures maintaining the balance of creation. The Book of Jubilees also paints a picture of angels doing more than guiding human souls. They are actively controlling the passage of time. In Jubilees 2 9, we read, for God ordained that the sun should keep its course according to the divisions of the seasons. These angels aren't just observing humanity. They're weaving the very fabric of time itself, ensuring that the sun, moon, and stars follow their divine paths, all according to God's original blueprint. This perspective on time as a divinely ordered structure, overseen by angelic beings, may feel both awe-inspiring and strange, raising questions about the calendar we follow and the divine order we might be missing. Imagine this. When humanity steps out of God's divine time, chaos starts to creep in, a recurring theme in the Book of Jubilees. One of the book's boldest claims is that the world should be following a solar calendar rather than a lunar one. Many ancient cultures, including the Israelites, eventually relied on a lunar calendar, but according to Jubilees, this was a mistake. It insists that only a solar calendar aligns with God's intended order, structuring time exactly as God set it at the beginning of creation. The book describes a year with 364 days, broken down into 52 flawless weeks, with each season, spring, summer, fall, and winter, containing exactly 13 weeks or 91 days. This perfect symmetry ensures that the Sabbath and all other sacred festivals consistently fall on the correct days every year. What's fascinating is that this solar calendar aligns remarkably with the Ethiopian calendar still used by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church today. In this system, 
The Ethiopian year has 13 months, with 12 months of 30 days each and an additional month, known as Pagum, of five or six days to account for the differences. Could it be that this ancient calendar from Jubilees has been preserved in Ethiopia's modern system? One of the few left that might reflect the sacred time described in Jubilees? By contrast, the lunar calendar adopted by many ancient cultures, and still in use by some, introduces inconsistencies. Its irregularity means that months and holy days shift, disrupting the alignment with God's plan. Jubilees is clear about the impact of this shift, warning that following a lunar cycle introduces spiritual disarray and leads to worship on abominable days that defy God's set times. This concept is emphasized in Jubilees 637, which states, There will be those who will surely make observations of the moon, but they will disturb the seasons and make an abominable day the day of testimony. For Jubilees, observing the lunar calendar isn't just an error. It's a form of defiance against God's command. The book suggests that by realigning with the solar calendar, humanity can rediscover and reconnect with the divine rhythm set in motion at the dawn of time. Jubilees doesn't simply mirror Genesis' six-day creation narrative. It expands upon it, focusing especially on the seventh day, the Sabbath. According to Jubilees, when God rested on this day, he did more than take a break. He sanctified it as an eternal law, a, a divine institution established not just for humans, but for the angels as well. This Sabbath isn't only part of the weekly cycle, but forms the basis for God's broader structure of time, playing into larger time cycles, including the 49-year Jubilee cycles. These cycles aim to return the world to harmony with God's order, providing periods of renewal, release, and rest for people, the land, and even the angelic realms. As stated in Jubilees 2 colon 1, he sanctified the seventh day and blessed it for all times as a sign of holiness for all his works. The idea of the Sabbath as an unbreakable, divine law reveals Jubilees' intent to add deeper meaning to the Genesis account. Rather than a mere story, the Sabbath is portrayed as a cosmic principle, a time structure that governs all creation and the order of the universe itself. The Book of Jubilees also revisits the story of Adam's creation on the sixth day, as told in Genesis, but with additional layers. It tells us that immediately after creating Adam, God entrusted him with specific commandments, guiding him on the Sabbath observance, purity rituals, and regulations about marriage and worship. These commandments were part of a sacred covenant that God made with Adam, meant to be upheld by him and his descendants. Unlike Genesis, which depicts God directly instructing Adam, Jubilees introduces angelic beings as intermediaries who help relay God's commandments. These beings, particularly the angels of the presence, play an essential role in teaching Adam and Eve the principles of holiness, sacrifice, and moral integrity. In an intriguing account, Jubilees describes how, on the sixth day of the second week, the angels presented Adam with all the animals of the earth. In orderly succession, they brought the beasts on the first day, cattle on the second, birds on the third, creatures that move on the earth on the fourth, and everything that moves in water on the fifth. This moment, as described in the book, showcases God's organized creation, each creature entering the world with a purpose and assigned order. By presenting the animals to Adam, the angels were enacting God's will, further illustrating how even in creation's early stages, angelic beings were active, maintaining order and setting the foundation for a structured world. Let's start by diving into a powerful concept, the role of God's law in shaping both heavenly and earthly realms. In the Book of Jubilees, this idea is strongly reinforced through angelic interaction. These heavenly beings taught Adam that God's laws were not merely human constructs, but eternal principles that even angels were bound to observe. This connection between heaven and earth through divine law highlights that these commandments weren't arbitrary, but foundational to creation itself. This notion raises a profound question. Could it be that God's laws were given to humanity long before Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments? If these divine principles were handed down by angels to Adam, how do they compare to the laws Moses eventually brought to the Israelites? 
Imagine if the story of God's commandments started much earlier than we were taught, weaving through the generations from Adam to Noah and then to Abraham. If you're intrigued by the ancient laws passed down at the beginning of time, drop a comment below to let us know. Would you like us to go deeper into these first divine laws? Understanding these commandments could give us new perspectives on what it means to live in alignment with God's will, even from humanity's earliest days. After the fall of Adam and Eve, Jubilees offers more depth into the lives of their children, specifically Cain and Abel. While Genesis simply records that Cain murdered Abel, Jubilees adds layers to the story, portraying this murder as the first major transgression against God's law, a devastating event that had repercussions for all of humanity. Cain's act of killing his brother is seen as a turning point, a moment where humans had introduced long-lasting spiritual consequences. Yet, despite this tragedy, the righteous line of humanity continues through Seth, Adam's third son. In the Book of Jubilees, Seth is depicted as a figure of purity and obedience who follows the laws handed down from the angels, keeping the covenant alive. This legacy paved the way for Noah, whose story takes on new dimensions in Jubilees as he becomes the carrier of God's covenant in the midst of a corrupt world. Now, while Genesis tells us about the Great Flood and Noah's survival, Jubilees goes further, revealing deeper insights into the events that both led up to and followed the Flood. Jubilees focuses intently on the moral decay that plagued humanity and the earth, highlighting the influence of the Nephilim, offspring of fallen angels and human women. In Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4, we get a brief mention of these beings, but Jubilees offers a clearer view of how they contributed to the wickedness that prompted God to purify the earth. The book describes how lawlessness spread among men, animals, and every living thing, to the point where all of creation was corrupted, resulting in chaos and disorder. In Jubilees 5 2, it states, And lawlessness increased on the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way, like men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walks on the earth. All of them corrupted their ways and their orders, and they began to devour each other. The problem wasn't just human sinfulness. It was also the influence of these fallen angels who introduced forbidden knowledge and disrupted the natural order God had set. As this corruption intensified, God's response was decisive. He sent the flood as a means to cleanse the earth, wiping away the wickedness that had overtaken creation. But Noah and his family, marked by their faithfulness, were spared. According to Jubilees, God didn't just spare Noah. He established a new covenant with him after the flood, emphasizing principles of purity, righteousness, and obedience to his laws. This covenant was significant, as it reaffirmed humanity's need to remain in line with God's order to prevent further judgment. God gave Noah laws that would later form the basis of the Mosaic laws, instructing him on sacrifices, ritual purity, and the observance of the Sabbath. This shows that long before the laws were codified by Moses, key principles were already in place through God's covenant with Noah. The book also tells us that Noah observed these laws faithfully, including the Sabbath and purity regulations, marking a fresh start for humanity while reinforcing the importance of maintaining alignment with God's will. The instructions for sacrifice, for example, were the same principles later formalized in the Mosaic Law, emphasizing how these practices were embedded in divine history. Noah was to offer burnt offerings in a specific manner and keep himself pure, both in body and spirit. This wasn't just for Noah. It was a framework intended to guide his descendants and help them live holy lives in a world that had previously gone astray. When we get to the story of Abraham in Genesis, we see God's promise unfold, but Jubilees takes us even further back into his youth adding a new perspective on his life. According to Jubilees, Abraham's journey didn't begin when he left his homeland. It began in a family steeped in idolatry. His father, Terah, was a worshiper of false gods, something that Genesis doesn't mention, but Jubilees paints a vivid picture of a young Abraham who rejects his family's idol worship, choosing instead to seek the one true God. In a powerful scene, Abraham confronts his father, questioning him about these idols. My father, tell me, what is this idol you worship? 
Abraham saw it for what it was, an empty image made of stone, in an act of rebellion. He destroys these idols in front of everyone, symbolizing his commitment to the one true God. Jubilees 11 colon 16 dash 17 describes Abraham's bold act, and Abraham burned them before the eyes of all and fled into the wilderness. This moment defines Abraham as a revolutionary figure who stands against the idolatrous practices of his time. Unlike the Genesis narrative that emphasizes Abraham's obedience to God's call to leave his homeland, Jubilees gives us a glimpse of Abraham as a young man who made a deliberate choice to break free from the cultural norms around him. This bold act foreshadows his later role as the father of a chosen people dedicated to rejecting pagan practices and following God's ways. One of the most striking distinctions between Genesis and Jubilees is the idea that Abraham was already observing divine laws long before Moses appeared. In Genesis, we mainly see Abraham obeying the command for circumcision, as described in Genesis 17. However, in Jubilees, Abraham is portrayed as someone who kept the Sabbath, made sacrifices, and adhered to laws that we often associate with Moses' time. According to Jubilees, these laws were not new. They were part of a continuous covenant, passed down by angels to each generation, beginning with Adam. Abraham's knowledge of these commandments, and his adherence to them, is a testament to a covenant relationship with God that spanned centuries. In the end, Jubilees suggests that divine law has always been at the heart of humanity's relationship with God. These ancient stories give us a broader context for understanding how these laws were passed down, evolving yet remaining timeless, guiding humanity to live in harmony with God's creation. Let me know if you're curious about exploring more of these ancient texts that add fresh dimensions to the stories we thought we knew. In the book of Jubilees, there's a fascinating addition to Abraham's story that sets him on a divine path beyond what's told in Genesis. Abraham wasn't just walking a personal faith journey. He was a crucial part of a cosmic plan. Angels guided him directly, teaching him about laws inscribed on heavenly tablets. These laws, not merely symbolic, were eternal principles meant to align humans with a divine order encompassing both heaven and earth. Among these laws were commands concerning the Sabbath and purity rituals, which were later codified by Moses, but were already being practiced by Abraham as part of God's overarching covenant. One of the most pivotal commands given to Abraham was the covenant of circumcision, highlighted in Genesis 17, where God instructs Abraham to circumcise himself and all males in his household as a sign of the covenant. However, Jubilees takes this act further, explaining that circumcision wasn't simply a personal or tribal custom. It was part of a divine law pre-established from the beginning of creation. This ritual wasn't just a family tradition, but a cosmic command, documented on heavenly tablets that lay out all laws binding both angels and humans. Jubilees 1525 explains this, emphasizing that the law of circumcision was eternal, meant to be followed by all generations without exception. This law is for all generations forever. It declares, there is no circumcision of the days, and no passing over one day out of the eight days, for it is an eternal ordinance ordained and written on the heavenly tablets. Through this, Jubilees deepens the meaning of circumcision from a physical sign to a profound way of aligning oneself with the universe's divine order, as designed by God. Moving forward in Abraham's life, one of the most dramatic stories in Genesis is the binding of Isaac, known as the Akita, where God tests Abraham's loyalty by asking him to sacrifice his only son. Genesis 22 verses 1 to 19 portrays this as a test between Abraham and God, but Jubilees adds additional layers, turning it into a cosmic event with profound spiritual implications. According to Jubilees, it's the angel Mastema, often associated with Satan, who suggests this trial, hoping Abraham will fail. This positioning of Mastema as an antagonist introduces a new spiritual dimension, showing that this test wasn't just about obedience, but was a clash in a much larger spiritual warfare between forces of good and evil. The text states that God permitted the test to reveal the depth of Abraham's faith 
and to show that he could withstand temptation, even in the face of Mastema's attempts to see him fail. Jubilee's 1810 captures the moment of divine intervention. And I stood before him and before the prince of the Mastema. It reads, And the Lord said, Command him not to lay his hand on the lad, nor to do anything to him, for I have shown that he fears the Lord. This passage introduces a heightened sense of spiritual significance. Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac isn't just a personal demonstration of faith, but is portrayed as part of a battle between cosmic forces. While Genesis focuses on the personal testing of Abraham, Jubilees paints this moment as one where good triumphs over evil where Abraham's loyalty to God stands as a victory against the forces that seek to challenge his faith. In Genesis 25 verse 23, we learn that before Jacob and Esau were even born, God tells their mother, Rebekah, that two nations will come from her womb, and that the elder, Esau, will serve the younger, Jacob. Jubilees expands upon this prophecy by suggesting that the dynamic between Jacob and Esau wasn't just about sibling rivalry, but was instead part of God's divine plan, one meant to establish the line through which righteousness would continue. This prophecy adds an element of destiny, revealing that Jacob was always chosen to carry on the covenant. Jubilees goes even further, noting that Isaac and Rebekah had divine foreknowledge of Esau's rebellious nature and his descendants' opposition to Israel. According to Jubilees 19.13, the Lord said unto her, Two nations shall be divided from your womb, and one nation shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. This prophecy in Jubilees emphasizes that Jacob's role as the covenant bearer wasn't a matter of chance or human intervention. It was a preordained element of a cosmic narrative. Unlike the Genesis version, which suggests Jacob used cunning to obtain the birthright, Jubilees implies that Jacob's actions were necessary steps to fulfill a divine order. His path was carved out by God, and his actions, even when appearing deceptive, were part of a grander design. A crucial aspect of the story in Jubilees is the characterization of Esau. While Genesis depicts Esau as a brother who simply loses his birthright to Jacob, Jubilees goes further by presenting Esau as a figure of rebellion, someone whose lineage represents a nation that will grow to stand in opposition to Israel. The Edomites, Esau's descendants, are portrayed not only as adversaries to Jacob's descendants, but as part of a deeper, cosmic conflict between righteousness and rebellion. Jubilees 37 colon 1 expands on this, stating, And Esau took his wives and his sons and all that he had, and went up to the hill country of Seir, and lived there. And Esau became a nation, and they oppressed Jacob's descendants. The text contrasts the destinies of Jacob and Esau by showing how Esau's lineage becomes a nation that directly conflicts with Israel, fulfilling the prophecy that the elder would serve the younger. This adds a profound layer of meaning, turning Esau's life from a personal rivalry into a symbol of ongoing opposition that continues throughout history. One of the most significant episodes in Jacob's life is his receipt of the blessing from his father, Isaac. In the book of Genesis, Jacob's blessing marks the beginning of Israel's 12 tribes. Genesis 27 focuses on Jacob receiving his father's blessing, which makes him the father of a nation. But the book of Jubilees expands this blessing's significance, emphasizing that Jacob didn't just inherit land or authority. He was entrusted with preserving divine laws handed down from Abraham. According to Jubilees, after Jacob receives the blessing, he's shown divine laws by God and angels, laws which he and his descendants must follow faithfully. These laws include observing the Sabbath, maintaining purity rituals, and following a sacred calendar, all elements that would later become part of the Mosaic Law. Jacob is portrayed as more than just a patriarch. He's the keeper of a covenant meant to guide his descendants in their relationship with God. In this role, he serves as the guardian of an eternal bond with God, holding responsibility not just for his family, but for an entire nation's adherence to divine ordinances. In Jubilees 27 23, God appears to Jacob at night and reaffirms this commitment, saying, I'm the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you sleep, I give to you and your descendants. 
Your descendants shall be as the stars in the sky. Here, Jacob's blessing is portrayed not just as a family inheritance, but as part of a cosmic order governing both heaven and earth. By portraying Jacob as the inheritor of divine laws, Jubilees elevates his role beyond that of simply receiving a birthright. He becomes a steward of God's eternal commandments, linking him to the heavenly tablets referenced earlier in Jubilees as God's blueprint for humanity and the universe. Jubilees further builds upon Jacob and Esau's sibling rivalry, turning it into a prophetic vision of ongoing tension between their descendants. Where Genesis narrates their personal conflict, Jubilee sees a cosmic struggle reflected in the conflict, portraying Esau's descendants as nations set to continually oppose Israel, Jacob's descendants. This ongoing rivalry isn't just a family feud, but a reflection of a larger spiritual conflict. Jubilees interprets this enmity as a battle between forces of righteousness, represented by Jacob and Israel, and forces of rebellion, represented by Esau and Edom. In this vision, Esau's descendants are depicted as future adversaries of God's chosen people, and this prophecy contributes to the apocalyptic themes present in Jubilees, connecting the struggle between the two brothers to an end of the the book emphasizes that this tension extends far beyond personal grievances, linking Esau's descendants directly to Israel's historical and spiritual challenges. In Jubilees 45,3, it says, And Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt, where Joseph resided, while Esau's sons remained in Edom. From that day forward, enmity between these nations remained. In Genesis, Esau goes his way and parts peacefully, but Jubilees interprets the divide between Jacob and Esau as the root of a future spiritual struggle, with Esau's line becoming symbolic of rebellion against God's will. Here, the opposition isn't only about territory or family history, but is an integral part of a spiritual narrative concerning the ultimate conflict between good and evil. Genesis recounts the births of Jacob's 12 sons, who become the forefathers of Israel's tribes. Each son, born through Jacob's wives Leah and Rachel, as well as through their maidservants, becomes the leader of a tribe. Jubilees, however, introduces a new perspective, presenting these births as divinely orchestrated events. According to Jubilees, God didn't just allow these births, but scheduled them to align with a sacred timeline. The text suggests that each son's birth followed a divine calendar emphasizing the importance of God's plan in establishing Israel's 12 tribes. In Jubilees 28, 12, it says, And Jacob's wives and maidservants gave birth to his 12 sons, each according to the time set by the Lord, and their destinies were inscribed on the heavenly tablets. This adds depth to the birth of each son, reinforcing the idea that the 12 tribes of Israel were not just a product of familial relations, but a key part of God's predetermined plan. The Book of Jubilees also explores the story of Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, who loses his status after a serious moral failing. Genesis 35 verse 22 tells of Reuben's sin, which disqualifies him from his rights as the firstborn. However, Jubilees takes this further by framing Reuben's action as a significant spiritual breach of divine law. His transgression isn't just seen as a personal mistake, but as a violation that disrupts his alignment with God's cosmic order. This loss opens the door for Judah, Jacob's fourth son, to rise as the leader of the tribes and for Levi to assume the priestly role, shaping Israel's leadership and spiritual structure according to God's design. In Jubilees 33:10, it's written, Because of his sin, the firstborn Reuben was not reckoned in the inheritance, but Judah was chosen as the prince over his brothers, and Levi for the priesthood forever. Here, Judah's rise is portrayed not as a coincidence, but as part of God's eternal plan, while Levi's selection for priesthood connects directly to the divine mandate. In Jubilees, these shifts in family roles represent more than human events. They signify alignment with a divine order guiding Israel's future. This interpretation of Reuben's fall and Judah and Levi's rise makes them participants in a cosmic plan that governs spiritual leadership among Israel's descendants. In the Bible, Levi's descendants become the priests of Israel, a role passed down through Moses and Aaron, 
who both come from the tribe of Levi. But in Jubilees, Levi's role as a priestly figure is portrayed as preordained. The book argues that Levi's selection wasn't merely a tribal decision, but part of an eternal order established by God, and that his priestly duties were already written on the heavenly tablets, long before they were formalized under Moses. Levi was set apart as a guardian of divine law, responsible for keeping Israel aligned with God's commandments. This elevation of Levi's role in Jubilees suggests that the Levitical priesthood didn't start with Moses. Instead, it was an ancient mandate rooted in God's cosmic design. Levi's role as a priest is thus depicted as a bridge between heaven and earth, giving him special duties that extend beyond his lifetime. In Jubilees, Jacob's blessing on his sons goes beyond giving them individual destinies. It connects them to a larger spiritual legacy. The Twelve Sons aren't just founders of Israel's tribes. They are part of a divine lineage. Their stories, individually and collectively, unfold according to a blueprint established by God, and their actions echo in the spiritual realm. The choices and lives of Jacob's sons are, in Jubilee's view, a reflection of God's cosmic plan, their destinies inscribed in the heavenly tablets as eternal truths guiding Israel's purpose and God's relationship with humanity. Thus, Jubilees transforms the patriarch story from a historical narrative into a story of spiritual destiny. Each patriarch and every action, whether it's Abraham's faith, Jacob's covenant, or Levi's priesthood, becomes part of a divine drama involving angels, heavenly laws, and a cosmic struggle between good and evil. While Genesis focuses on the personal journeys of these figures, Jubilees elevates them showing how every decision fits into a grand design that spans history and touches eternity. This interpretation creates a narrative that portrays God's relationship with humanity as one of deep intentionality, with each figure contributing to a cosmic plan that transcends time, shaping the spiritual destiny of nations and setting the stage for an ultimate victory over darkness. In the Book of Jubilees, we get a unique perspective on the Levitical priesthood that goes beyond what's outlined in Genesis and Exodus. While traditional accounts focus on the priesthood's establishment under Moses, Jubilees claims that Levi's priestly role was ordained from the very beginning, an eternal aspect of God's cosmic plan. In Jubilees 32, 17, it's stated that Levi was set apart for the priesthood forever, chosen to offer sacrifices and mediate between God and his people. This isn't just a response to the historical moment at Mount Sinai, but rather a divine appointment that aligns with the order set out on the heavenly tablets, a concept that portrays the laws and covenants as part of a pre-existing celestial blueprint. Moving into the story of Jacob's 12 sons, Jubilees adds layers of meaning to their formation as the tribes of Israel. Genesis primarily tells us about Jacob's sons and their journeys, eventually settling in the Promised Land. But in Jubilees, these tribes are more than mere inheritors of land. They are entrusted as guardians of God's commandments. Each tribe has a distinct spiritual responsibility, grounded in the divine law passed down from Abraham and Isaac. They are not just chosen to govern or occupy land, but to act as stewards of His holy commandments, upholding a sacred legacy that stretches back to their forefathers. Jubilees 29 colon, 6 shows us that God told Jacob, These are the laws for your sons and their descendants forever. The responsibility of preserving these commandments wasn't a mere family tradition, but a cosmic duty, a divine inheritance meant to secure Israel's relationship with God for generations to come. This focus on the tribes as guardians of divine law reinforces the idea that their actions are part of a larger spiritual purpose. In the Genesis account, the twelve tribes come into being through Jacob's sons, each becoming a leader of their own family line. But in Jubilees, these family lines carry an additional layer of accountability. Each tribe plays a cosmic role, preserving the divine order laid out on the heavenly tablets, linking them to Israel's spiritual destiny. The narrative places the tribes within a divine framework, suggesting that their births, responsibilities, and challenges were all preordained aspects of a greater cosmic order that governs heaven and earth. Jubilees further expands on the story of Joseph, 
a central figure in both Genesis and the biblical history of Israel. In Genesis, Joseph's rise to power in Egypt is depicted as a result of his ability to interpret dreams and navigate the political landscape, ultimately saving his family from famine. However, Jubilees reinterprets Joseph's story, presenting it not merely as a tale of personal resilience, but as a divinely orchestrated event foreseen on the heavenly tablets. According to Jubilees 42:2, Joseph's ascent to power in Egypt was destined to create the conditions necessary for Israel's eventual exodus. His life wasn't just a narrative of personal success. It was a cosmic turning point where God's plans for Israel's preservation and future liberation began to unfold. This reimagined perspective in Jubilees transforms Joseph's journey into something far more profound. Joseph was destined to lead his family into Egypt, where they would find refuge from famine. But this was also the beginning of a period of bondage, one that would eventually lead to their deliverance through God's miraculous intervention. Jubilees places emphasis on the fact that Joseph's life and achievements weren't simply a result of his own capabilities. They were written into the divine script of history. His path, his protection, and even his sufferings were all part of God's overarching plan to bring about Israel's redemption from Egypt, a plan that had cosmic implications and was documented in the celestial realm. In Jubilees, the story of Joseph's journey is filled with divine encounters and protection from angels, a detail not found in Genesis. While Genesis shows Joseph's unwavering faith and resilience in God's promise, Jubilees describes how angels were actively involved in his life. These angels served as protectors, guiding him and ensuring that he would fulfill his destined role in Egypt. When Joseph was sold into slavery, it wasn't just an unfortunate twist. It was a pivotal moment marked by divine intervention. Jubilees 34 21 states that God sent his angels to watch over Joseph making sure that he survived the hardships he faced, since his life was deemed precious in the eyes of the Lord. This added element of angelic guardianship emphasizes that Joseph's journey to Egypt wasn't a random sequence of events, but a deliberate path that God had orchestrated, monitored, and safeguarded from the very beginning. One of the most intriguing elements in Jubilees is its reinterpretation of the brothers' betrayal of Joseph. In Genesis, their jealousy and subsequent betrayal are seen primarily as a familial issue, a result of their envy over their father's favoritism. But in Jubilees, this act is given much greater weight, viewed as a transgression against the divine order itself. By selling Joseph, the brothers committed a sin that disrupted the cosmic balance, a sin recorded on the heavenly tablets. They were not merely envious siblings. They were violators of God's eternal laws, held accountable for actions that rippled far beyond their immediate family. Jubilees 34 9 notes that their betrayal was a significant offense against God's cosmic laws, carrying consequences that extended to their descendants, who would suffer unless the brothers repented. This interpretation heightens the moral gravity of the story, making the betrayal not just a personal failing, but a breach in the divine order. Jubilees also frames Joseph's role as inherently tied to the future exodus. While Genesis concludes his story with his family's peaceful settlement in Egypt, Jubilees extends his life into a prophetic vision. Joseph, aware of the future trials his descendants would face in Egypt, prepares them for the eventual deliverance God had promised. In Jubilees 46 9, Joseph tells his brothers of God's future intervention urging them not to despair because their fate and God's promise were already sealed on the heavenly tablets. This prophetic insight adds a deeper dimension to Joseph's story, portraying him as a figure who bridges the immediate challenges of his family with the long-term destiny of his people. His life foreshadows the eventual exodus, providing a sense of hope that God's plan was already in motion, promising liberation and renewal even in the midst of bondage. The text of Jubilees concludes that Joseph's story, and indeed the entire narrative of the patriarchs, is part of a much grander cosmic design. The events that befall Jacob's sons, the establishment of the tribes, and the trials in Egypt are not merely historical occurrences, but unfoldments of God's will. The patriarchs, through their lives and choices, serve as conduits of divine prophecy, 
each act contributing to the alignment of heaven and earth. The Book of Jubilees ultimately places the story of Israel within a universal framework, reminding its readers that the events recounted are part of a cosmic struggle between good and evil, guided by God's hand toward a predetermined resolution. Through its reinterpretation, Jubilees invites its readers to see these ancient stories as part of a larger, divine narrative, one that calls for faithfulness to God's commandments and a commitment to the cosmic order he established. In the Book of Jubilees, the life and death of Joseph carry a powerful prophetic weight that shapes the course of Israel's story. Unlike Genesis, which closes Joseph's story with his death as a peaceful ending, Jubilees portrays it as the start of something significant, a transition leading to Israel's eventual enslavement, which was already part of God's cosmic plan for redemption. Joseph's death is not just an end. It signals the beginning of Israel's bondage in Egypt and foreshadows a future deliverance that would showcase God's power in an extraordinary way. While Genesis begins Israel's story of oppression with the rise of a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, Exodus 1 verses 8 to 14, Jubilees takes a step back, suggesting that even this enslavement was part of a divine prophecy inscribed on heavenly tablets. In this light, the Book of Jubilees offers a perspective where Israel's descent into bondage isn't accidental or merely political. It's woven into a grand narrative that leads toward a miraculous deliverance. Jubilees explains that God had foretold Israel's enslavement well before it occurred, and that this challenging time was intended to lead Israel toward the Exodus and ultimately to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. This approach makes Joseph's actions pivotal. By bringing his family into Egypt, he was setting the stage for a destiny that would involve both oppression and liberation. Yes, he saved his family from famine, but this rescue was only the beginning of Israel's journey in Egypt, where their story would evolve from survival to servitude, ultimately revealing God's might through a spectacular deliverance. According to Jubilees 48,1, the heavenly tablets recorded that Israel would be oppressed in Egypt and that God would redeem them with great power and wonders. This interpretation adds a cosmic purpose to Israel's suffering. Their bondage wasn't random, but a carefully designed step in a divine plan that would glorify God. The story of Israel's enslavement, then, is not just historical, it's a spiritual narrative where every hardship serves a purpose. Jubilees frames Israel's time in Egypt as a necessary trial that would spiritually prepare them to receive God's law at Mount Sinai. In Exodus, we see God's mighty acts directly bringing about the plagues that weaken Pharaoh and release Israel from his grip, Exodus 7 to 12. But Jubilees brings another layer to this story. It introduces a dimension of spiritual warfare where angels and dark forces actively clash. The Book of Jubilees explains that the oppression of Israel wasn't merely a matter of Pharaoh's stubbornness. It was part of an intense cosmic battle. Here, Mastema, a figure often associated with Satan, plays a critical role. Mastema is depicted as hardening Pharaoh's heart and driving the Egyptians to harshly oppress Israel, increasing their suffering as part of a spiritual test of Israel's faith in God. According to Jubilees 48,9, Mastema stood against Israel, aiming to break their faith by imposing severe hardships through Pharaoh's cruel decrees. This cosmic conflict introduces a new understanding of Israel's bondage. It wasn't just a struggle for physical freedom, but also a spiritual test that required perseverance. Jubilees portrays Mastema and his followers as agents of evil, working to intensify Israel's suffering and undermine their faith in God's promises. As the Israelites groaned under the weight of their burdens, Mastema hoped to break their spirit. Instead, this trial would ultimately strengthen their resolve. The oppression in Egypt becomes a battleground where Israel's faithfulness is tested, but God's commitment to his people is also reaffirmed. Through the lens of Jubilees, we see the plagues of Egypt as acts of divine justice, but also as moves in a cosmic chess game between good and evil forces. The battle isn't only for Israel's release from physical slavery, it's a struggle over their loyalty to God. The plagues themselves, as described in Exodus 7 to 12, are traditionally viewed as miracles designed to break Pharaoh's will. However, in Jubilees, 
these plagues take on a symbolic and spiritual significance. They aren't just tools of punishment. They serve to demonstrate the powerlessness of Egypt's gods in comparison to the God of Israel. Each plague challenges and ultimately defeats a specific Egyptian deity, revealing that these gods were merely empty idols with no real power. Jubilees 48 to 11 captures this theme, explaining that the plagues weren't simply a judgment on Pharaoh, but a spiritual declaration that the gods of Egypt were powerless before the Almighty. By undermining these false powers, God not only frees Israel, but dismantles the spiritual oppression that the Egyptian deities represent. In Jubilees, every plague becomes a cosmic strike against the darkness that has kept Israel in bondage, showing that the God of Israel reigns supreme over all creation. As the Nile turned to blood and darkness fell upon the land, each plague was more than a physical manifestation. It was a victory over the spiritual rulers of Egypt, each defeated in succession to prove that only the God of Israel had dominion over the heavens and the earth. This version of the story transforms the Exodus into a statement of divine sovereignty, with each act of God defying the spiritual forces aligned against his people. It's not just about breaking Pharaoh's power. It's about freeing Israel from the influence of foreign gods and confirming their loyalty to the one true God. A central idea in Jubilees is the concept of the heavenly tablets, which add a unique layer to the story. In this account, the timing of the Exodus isn't left to chance. It's inscribed on these divine tablets, marking it as part of God's cosmic timetable. Jubilees explains that every element of Israel's journey, from their arrival in Egypt, through their suffering, to their eventual deliverance, was written and orchestrated to align with God's sacred calendar. This predetermined timeline doesn't only affirm God's control over events, but links the Exodus to a divine order that stretches back to the creation of the universe. In Jubilees 49:1, it's said that the specific timing of Israel's release from Egypt was set on the 14th day of the first month, a date sanctified from the beginning of creation itself. This means that the Exodus wasn't just a historical turning point, it was a cosmic event aligned with the universe's spiritual laws. This portrayal is unique to Jubilees and adds a deeper, almost mystical significance to the story. It's as if Israel's deliverance was part of a spiritual rhythm that transcends time, where their release from bondage aligns perfectly with the structure of creation. The alignment with the heavenly tablets reinforces that God's promises to Israel are not arbitrary, but built into the very fabric of existence. By observing the sacred timing, Israel's deliverance aligns with the cosmic order, which Jubilees presents as essential to understanding the depth and impact of the Exodus. As we follow the story through Jubilees, we see the Exodus as more than just a liberation from Egypt. It's a restoration of divine order. The suffering endured by Israel was not a punishment, but a spiritual preparation, a refining process designed to ready them for the law they would soon receive at Mount Sinai. By enduring oppression, Israel is being ready to inherit a new identity as God's chosen people, bound by his laws and aligned with his holy timing. This new identity would require obedience to a moral and spiritual code that connected them directly to the divine reinforcing their unique relationship with God. In essence, Jubilee's version of the Exodus is a rich tapestry of faith, trial, and redemption. Israel's journey is framed within a cosmic narrative where their trials have purpose, and their deliverance is predestined by a divine calendar written in the heavens. As the story unfolds, Israel's fate is no longer about survival. It's about embracing a covenant that would define their relationship with God. Through the perspective of Jubilees, the Exodus story transforms from a simple tale of freedom into a profound act of cosmic redemption, where God's authority over both physical and spiritual realms is made undeniably clear. In the book of Jubilees, the plagues unleashed upon Egypt become more than mere divine punishments. They're portrayed as powerful weapons in a larger cosmic battle between the forces of good and evil. Here. The God of Israel emerges not only as the liberator of an oppressed people, but also as the ultimate victor over both the physical and spiritual realms of Egypt. Jubilees introduces the character of Mastema, 
a dark, satanic figure who rallies his forces to manipulate Pharaoh, hardening his heart and keeping Israel enslaved. Despite these forces working tirelessly behind the scenes, God's power repeatedly overcomes them, demonstrating his authority over all creation. While in the book of Exodus, we observe Moses receiving the commandments from God on Mount Sinai. Jubilees adds a profound layer to this moment. It explains that these laws weren't suddenly created on that mountain. They were already written on heavenly tablets that existed since the dawn of creation itself. According to Jubilees, these heavenly tablets are not just records but a cosmic framework for all of God's laws, preordained as guides for both angels and humans alike. In this way, Moses is not inventing or receiving a new set of rules. He is merely the chosen messenger, entrusted with delivering this ancient, eternal code to Israel at a pivotal moment. The Mosaic Law, therefore, is far more than just instructions for one nation. It's depicted as part of a universal order governing everything in existence. In Jubilees, the timing of the law's revelation to Moses wasn't arbitrary. It was aligned with a divine schedule, pre-written to be delivered at precisely the right time in the story of God's people fulfilling a prophecy that stretches back to creation itself. This understanding makes the laws much more than rules. They become timeless directives designed to shape Israel's destiny and to act as a testimony for all future generations of faith. Unlike the traditional view of the Mosaic Law being something new given only at Sinai, Jubilee suggests that these commandments were known and observed by the faithful long before Moses' time. While Genesis portrays figures like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as morally upright, it doesn't necessarily imply they followed a codified set of laws. Jubilees, however, paints a different picture. It claims that these patriarchs, revered in faith, were already keeping the Sabbath, practicing sacrifices, and adhering to many principles of the law that Moses would later formalize for Israel. By portraying the patriarchs as obedient to the divine commandments, Jubilees redefines the Mosaic Law as not a sudden innovation, but as a restoration of practices given to the righteous since humanity's earliest days. Abraham, for instance, is described as observing the Sabbath and even following dietary restrictions well before these laws were inscribed for the nation of Israel. As Jubilees 16.28 notes, Abraham kept the Sabbath, circumcised his sons, and followed the commandments of the law that were written on the heavenly tablets, with angels imparting this divine knowledge to him. This depiction provides an expanded perspective on the law as a timeless, unbroken tradition handed down through generations of the faithful. Moses' role, then, is seen as the human link completing this chain, formally delivering a full revelation of the law to Israel. Jubilee's account gives these commandments a universal quality presenting them as moral principles that have governed the righteous since the time of Adam, cementing their role in the divine plan for humanity. One of the most unique elements that Jubilees brings to the narrative of the Mosaic Law is its emphasis on a cosmic calendar. Here, time itself, marked by Sabbaths, festivals, and Jubilee years, is shown as integral to divine order, and Jubilees underscores that following this sacred timekeeping is essential for anyone who wishes to walk in God's favor. This focus on divinely ordained time periods is woven into the concept of the heavenly tablets, where timekeeping laws are recorded as part of an eternal, universal rhythm. The text of Jubilees advocates a solar calendar over a lunar one, defining the year as 364 days, aligning each Sabbath and festival with the precise days set in the divine order. The calendar is not simply a convenience for marking holy days. It's a sacred system that keeps the faithful in sync with God's plan. According to Jubilees, observing these precise days is vital to spiritual harmony. Deviating from this calendar could lead to error and, in turn, to spiritual disorder, distancing the people from God's will. In Jubilees 5, 2, God instructs Moses to record these laws about Sabbaths and festivals, declaring, Write down for Israel the law of the Sabbath and the festivals. For these times are ordained on the heavenly tablets, and you must observe them exactly, lest you fall into error. This profound focus on divine time-keeping doesn't appear with the same emphasis in the traditional biblical texts, 
where Sabbaths and festivals are important, but their cosmic origins aren't emphasized as strongly. Jubilees, however, insist that observing these times correctly is a key to remaining aligned with God, as the calendar is seen as an earthly reflection of a heavenly pattern. By following the cosmic calendar, humanity participates in a divine rhythm that brings order and harmony. While in traditional views, the Mosaic Law is often perceived as a set of directives exclusively meant for Israel, Jubilees expands this understanding, presenting the law as eternal and universal. These laws are not limited to a single people, but are portrayed as relevant and binding for all those who align themselves with God's principles. This perspective reframes the law, suggesting it was never intended solely for a specific nation, but rather as a foundational moral code, echoing through creation itself. In Jubilee's interpretation, Israel is entrusted with a unique role to uphold these laws publicly, setting an example that embodies God's order for all humanity. Jubilees also intensifies the significance of Moses' role, not as a creator or inventor of divine law, but as the chosen prophet who reveals these ancient truths to Israel. His encounter with God on Mount Sinai is depicted as a profound reconnection between the people of Israel and the eternal principles written at the dawn of creation. By framing the law in this cosmic context, Jubilees presents Moses as not only a leader, but as the link binding human history with divine eternity, bridging the temporal with the timeless, the earthly with the heavenly. Furthermore, Jubilees enriches the story of Moses by emphasizing his role in aligning Israel with a pre-existing divine blueprint. The emphasis is not on Moses introducing something entirely new. Instead, he is seen as the messenger of a plan that has been in place all along. The laws he receives are positioned as the culmination of God's preordained schedule, a framework set long ago to guide humanity back to its creator. This cosmic calendar in Jubilees, then, isn't just about days and festivals. It's about a grand design, a divine order meant to restore creation to its intended state. Observing the law means participating in a divinely synchronized rhythm, a system that has existed since before time was counted by humankind. In this light, Jubilees reinterprets Israel's role as a nation and the significance of the Mosaic law as a timeless, universal revelation. Israel's purpose, as depicted here, is not to serve merely as recipients of the law but to act as living witnesses to an eternal covenant, showcasing God's way to the rest of the world. By following these divinely ordained instructions, Israel becomes a model for all humanity, embodying the laws written on the heavenly tablets as a testimony to the cosmic order that underpins creation. This purpose, according to Jubilees, isn't limited to ancient times but resonates through every generation that seeks to walk in alignment with God's will. As we dive into Jubilee's cosmic perspective, it's clear that this text reframes the law's significance in a way that expands beyond traditional interpretations. The Mosaic Law isn't just for ancient Israel. It's a call to participate in God's plan, a moral compass meant for anyone who desires to follow the divine path. By adhering to this code, Israel serves as a beacon of light, pointing humanity back to a divine truth inscribed at creation a law that echoes through the ages and invites all to live in harmony with the Creator's design. Through this lens, the exodus and the giving of the law become not just historical events, but manifestations of a divine rhythm that resonates through the universe, inviting all of creation to return to its Maker. The Book of Jubilees presents a fascinating perspective on the laws inscribed on the heavenly tablets, depicting them not merely as temporary guidelines for a single nation, but as eternal principles that govern all creation, including both heaven and earth. This unique text emphasizes that the commandments given to Moses are intended to be followed by all of God's creations, including the angels, who are depicted as observing the Sabbath and celebrating God's festivals in the heavenly realms. This means the Mosaic law extends beyond humanity, it connects the spiritual and physical worlds, creating a divine order that resonates throughout the cosmos. Jubilees 50 13 states that the law handed down to Moses is eternal and will continue to be observed both in the heavens and here on earth. 
The angels abide by the Sabbath, while the righteous are called to uphold these commandments for eternity. This concept of an everlasting law isn't as clearly articulated in the conventional biblical narrative, which often centers on the covenant made specifically with the nation of Israel. Jubilees, on the other hand, presents the law as woven into the very fabric of the universe, binding both humans and angels to adhere to God's cosmic order. The future of Israel, as laid out in Jubilees, is not left to chance or random events. Instead, it unfolds according to a divinely ordained timeline, meticulously written on the heavenly tablets since the beginning of time. This timeline charts the rise and fall of nations, the exiles and returns of Israel, and the ultimate judgment that awaits the world. Everything that occurs in human history, from the act of creation to the final judgment, is believed to follow this cosmic schedule meticulously recorded in heaven. One of the standout features of Jubilees is its strong assertion that all historical events are preordained and that nothing transpires outside of God's divine will. The book lays out a prophetic overview of Israel's journey, revealing that their trials, including exile and suffering, as well as their eventual restoration, were inscribed in the heavenly records long before they occurred. Jubilees 2332 emphasizes that everything affecting Israel, from their rebellion to their redemption, was noted on the heavenly tablets, and the times appointed for their deliverance were established from the very beginning. While the accounts in Genesis and Exodus highlight specific moments in Israel's history, Jubilees provides a broader perspective, illustrating that Israel's fate is part of a grand cosmic narrative already determined by divine will. Jubilees places significant importance on the role of angels throughout the history of Israel, illustrating their critical involvement, especially during the end times. In this text, the angels of the Lord are charged with executing God's judgment upon the nations, ensuring that His divine will is manifested in both heaven and on earth. As the end of days approaches, the narrative describes how angels will descend to separate the righteous from the wicked, gathering those who have remained faithful to God's commandments. Moreover, Jubilees introduces the character of Mastema, who leads the evil spirits, and foretells his binding and casting into the abyss, signifying the ultimate defeat of darkness. As Jubilees 23:29 reveals, the Lord will send his angels to gather his chosen, and they shall bind the prince of the evil spirits, casting him into the abyss until the time of judgment when he shall be destroyed forever. This portrayal of angels as enforcers of divine justice adds a rich layer to the prophecies concerning the end times. While traditional biblical texts reference angels within the context of judgment, such as in the book of Revelation, Jubilees offers a more intricate view of their involvement in the spiritual battles that will unfold during the last days. One of the core themes in Jubilees is the prophetic vision regarding Israel's redemption. The narrative underscores that Despite periods of rebellion and exile, God has already set a specific time for Israel's restoration to their homeland and renewal of their covenant with Him. This restoration is not merely a political change. It embodies a spiritual renewal that aligns perfectly with the cosmic plan inscribed on the heavenly tablets. Jubilees asserts that Israel's redemption will follow a period of significant tribulation a time of purification during which the people will once again embrace holiness, preparing themselves for the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of God's kingdom here on earth. As Jubilees 23, 26 indicates, and the time will come when the children of Israel will turn back to the Lord with all their heart, and he will gather them from the nations and establish them in their land, as it was written on the heavenly tablets. While the traditional Bible also addresses the restoration of Israel, Seen in texts like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Jubilees enriches this narrative by asserting that such restoration is part of a predetermined timeline, with specific events already chronicled in the heavenly records. In the prophetic vision of the end times, Jubilees presents the arrival of a messianic kingdom, where God's chosen ruler, often interpreted as the Messiah, will usher in a reign of righteousness on earth. This kingdom signifies not only the conclusion of the current age, but also the beginning of God's everlasting rule, where the law is upheld and the righteous inherit the earth. The final judgment, as depicted in Jubilees, 
involves a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked, with the latter being cast into the lake of fire, where they face eternal destruction. Mastema and his evil spirits will be defeated, while the Messiah will reign in peace and justice. The apocalyptic imagery in Jubilees resonates with themes found in Revelation, yet it places greater emphasis on the restoration of the law and the re-establishment of the cosmic order. The text concludes with the promise that the Lord will establish his kingdom on earth, and the righteous shall rule with him. For the law shall be written on their hearts, and the wicked shall be cast into the lake of fire, as mentioned in Jubilees 15.13. This vision of a messianic kingdom encapsulates the hope for a renewed creation where the law is fully adhered to, and the faithful are rewarded for their dedication. The final judgment signifies the ultimate defeat of evil, paving the way for an era defined by eternal peace. If you found value in this exploration of the Book of Jubilees and its distinctive cosmic vision of biblical history, please consider sharing this video with others who might be intrigued by these profound insights. By sharing this knowledge, you help us continue to uncover ancient texts and reveal the hidden layers of God's eternal plan. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and join the conversation in the comments. Together, we can delve even deeper into these captivating biblical revelations.